Good evening, everyone, and welcome to New York Buddha Dharma. We have been working through um, the book The Myth of Freedom by Chögyam Trungpa. Is this close enough? Yeah, maybe that's better. And um, <clears throat> we're actually on the last chapter, which is entitled Tantra. So this is the most advanced of the chapters. <laughs> and um, these teachings, the you know, Tantra is pretty much the province of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. It developed in India. Um, probably appearing in the forests, maybe uh, forest yogis practicing, doing tantric practices um, sometime after the time of Christ, maybe as late as the 6th century AD. And at least that's when it started coming out of the forests and uh, moving its way into the monasteries and the great universities, Nalanda, Odantapuri, and Vikramashila, which are the great universities, Buddhist universities in India, housing thousands or even tens of thousands of monks. And so it developed fully in India. And in India, they, the three levels of uh, Buddhism, the so-called uh, Hinayana teachings and the uh, Mahayana, the greater vehicle. Yana means vehicle. Hinayana means lesser vehicle although uh, Trungpa Rinpoche preferred to call it the foundational vehicle. And then the Mahayana means greater vehicle, and the um, Vajrayana means adamantine vehicle. And uh, they are were seen as stages of the path from people who were practicing all of them together. Uh, in the 11th century, the Muslims invaded India and um, wiped Buddhism off the face of India. Buddhism was an easy target uh, because it was concentrated in monastic and uh, scholarly institutions. It wasn't so much a lay phenomena like Buddhism, I mean like Hinduism was. Um, Hinduism was impossible to wipe out because it was practiced by millions and millions and millions of people in the villages, uh, whereas Buddhism was practiced by monks in uh, monastic institutions and universities, so it was an easy uh, way, easy target for the Muslim invasion to wipe it off the face of India, which they did. But by that time, it had already left India as well. And uh, around, um, starting around the second century BC, Buddhism migrated to other countries. At that time, it migrated south to uh, Ceylon, and then from Ceylon into Southeast Asia over the next few centuries. And the kind of Buddhism that uh, left. See, what happened was that after the Buddha's death, the Sangha fractured and uh, entered the period of so-called 18 schools. Probably there were more than that, but that's what it's called. And the one of the predominant schools was the school was called um, the Sthaviravada, which means the Vada means doctrine and Sthavira means elders. So it was the, that school was called the Doctrine of the Elders. And it was that school that made its way south into Southeast Asia. And the teachings that that school practiced were characteristic of what now later Buddhism called the Hinayana teachings. They didn't contain the teaching, for instance, of shunyata, of emptiness, or of the bodhisattva, the person who dedicates him or her life uh, to the welfare and enlightenment of all other sentient beings. Uh, that the Sthaviravada school and the schools like it didn't contain that. A similar school made its way north into Tibet. It was called the Sarvastivada school. And that means the doctrine that everything exists. And it was very similar to the Sthaviravada. Um, and the Sthaviravada, when it went south, became called, it picked up, it was translated into Pali, and Sthavira became Terra. And so the, what went to Southeast Asia is the Theravada uh, Buddhism that is practiced in 
uh, Burma and uh, Cambodia, and uh, to some extent in Vietnam, although Vietnam also has Mahayana Buddhism. Now, at the same time, there was another school that was developing, had developed in India, uh, that called itself the Mahayana in competition with the uh, so-called other schools like the Sthaviravada and Sarvastivada. It called itself the greater vehicle, right? Greater than the other ones. There was competition going on. And it was the Mahayana school that it developed out of certain ones of the 18 schools. And it, um, it was characterized by a number of things, but primarily by, as I just mentioned, by the doctrine of emptiness and the doctrine of the bodhisattva. Uh, the bodhisattva uh, puts everyone else's enlightenment before his or her own enlightenment. And the bodhisattva has fundamentally um, achieved freedom from suffering by entering the world of, the, of emptiness, of shunyata, which is the world of reality, but not quite full enlightenment yet. And um, the, about the time of Christ, the Mahayana teachings left India, um, didn't leave India, but they migrated uh, to China. And they developed in China, and in about the 6th century, they went to Japan. And in about the 4th or 5th century, they went to Korea. So the Mahayana migrated east. Now, it wasn't until about the 7th century, traditionally, they have it, that Buddhism went to Tibet. Uh, it may have gone earlier, but traditional Buddhist histories place it in the seventh century. There was a king in Tibet named Songsen Gampo, and uh, he um, married a Chinese princess and got converted to Buddhism. And at that time, Tibet was, interestingly, they had no literature. They had no alphabet. They had no writing. And so Songsen Gampo, realizing that they really needed writing if they were going to study Buddhism, which he wanted to study now that he was converted, uh, he sent his prime minister, a man named Tongni Sambuta, to uh, India to bring back writing. And he did. He brought back the Sanskrit alphabet, which he and others modified and adapted to the Tibetan language, which is quite a feat, uh, because the Tibetan language is very dis different linguistically than Sanskrit. Utterly different very, very fundamentally different. But they did. And so Tibetan to, you know, now is written in the Sanskrit alphabet, although the letters have different uh, sound values. And um, the Buddhism that they brought back starting in the seventh century was the full shot. Everything, the so-called Hinayana teachings, the Savastivada had gone north and into Tibet. Um, with its doctrine of you know um, of uh, the Abhidharma teachings and uh, the Vinaya and all that, they teach the rules for monks and nuns, and as well as the Mahayana teachings about the Bodhisattva, as well as the Tantric teachings, which had come out of the forests starting in around the sixth century A.D. and into the monasteries, and they came from the monasteries in about the same time and went north to Tibet. So when Buddhism was wiped out of India it had already migrated uh, in its fullest, fullest form uh, to Tibet. And this is where the teachings of Tantra abide. Now, there was a very um, abbreviated form of Tantra and of the uh, Vajrayana teachings that went to China and also to Japan. In Japan, it still exists to this day in the form of a kind of Buddhism called Shingon uh, Buddhism. But it's very, very cut down compared to what went to Tibet, much less um, developed and articulated. So um, it went in the 6th century, 7th century. In the 8th century, there were some great teachers who came to Tibet, uh, starting with uh, a man named Atisha. No, starting, excuse me, with a man named uh, uh, Shanta Rakshita, who was a Mahayanist. And uh, there was a great king in the 8th century named Trisang Detson, who was also a Buddhist. And he brought Shantarakshita to Tibet and um, asked him to really establish Buddhism much more fully. So Shantarakshita started to uh, build the first monastery. In La it was in Lhasa, of course, capital of Tibet. Uh, and it was called Samyeling. But the problem was um, he was a Mahayanist. And 
he had uh, Mahayana students that he was teaching. And there were local deities, local spirits, that didn't want Buddhism to be established in, in Tibet. So uh, Shantarakshita and his students would build this monastery by day, and by night, these uh, demons, the local spirits, would tear it down. And finally, Shantarakshita, this is the story, um, went to King Trisang Detson and told him, look, uh, you know, basically he said, I don't have enough mojo you know, to do this. He said, there's a guy in India that you need to, to invite to come here. He can do this. And his name is Padmasambhava. And um, <laughs> Padmasambhava originally probably came from Afghanistan. Nobody knows for sure. He's, uh, they say he came from a place called Udiana. And um, the best guess is that Udiana is in what is now uh, Afghanistan uh, and is particularly in a particular valley called the Swat Valley, which is a really remarkable place. Um, I think I've talked about this before, right? Western terminus of the Silk Routes. Um, there were two major Silk Routes that went across Central Asia to China, to and from China, both one to the north and one to the south of this vast w desert wasteland called the Taklamakan. And they converged in China in a, a pretty interesting place called Dunhuang on the western edge of China. Dunhuang, I'll just, I'm rambling here, but this is fun anyhow. Uh, Dunhuang uh, was this place where all kinds of people were going through Dunhuang because they were coming across Central Asia. You know, pilgrims and merchants and people of all kinds. And uh, there was also a Buddhist community in Dunhuang, and there were caves there, and the Buddhist monks lived in caves. And as an act of uh, piety, what they did was they copied scriptures. Now, in those days, just as with Christians, you know, there were no printing presses, of course. So it was an act of piety uh, and of uh, holiness to actually copy scriptures by hand. And of course, uh, just, just the same thing in the Christian tradition, in Christian monasteries in the West. And uh, <coughs> But they were short of paper. There wasn't a lot of stuff to write on, right? And so what they did was they, they used whatever they could find. And what they found were things that these pilgrims coming across Central Asia would leave behind, bills of lading, travel diaries, all kinds of things. And the monks would take them and flip them over and copy sutras and Buddhist teachings on the back. Now, in about the seventh century, um, for one reason or another, the Buddhist community in Dunhuang dissolved. And the caves in which those monks lived, don't ask me why, I don't know this, but somebody might, they were sealed with mud and rock. And they were sealed hermetically. In um, the early 20th century, a French archeologist named Pelio discovered these caves and opened them. And inside he found, of course, statuary, Buddhist statues, but he also found all of these writings, you know, that the monks had copied. And when he flipped them over, and he, he found all these bills of lading and travel diaries, some of them written in languages no one had ever seen before. Languages of civilizations that had risen and disappeared in Central Asia over the millennia, and which, for which there was no Rosetta Stone, at least at that time, you know, they couldn't decipher them. Isn't that amazing? Critical, like magic, magical story. Yeah? You have something to say? Yeah. Now, on the western terminus, um, that was in this area called the Swat Valley in Afghanistan. And uh, before the troubles uh, in Afghanistan, one of our community members, uh, who Rochelle knows, Deborah Shostak Klimberg, and her husband Max, uh, they were archaeologists and they used to go there and dig. And Deborah described it as being like a cultural layer cake because all of these different travelers coming across, there were Manichae Christians and there were Muslims and there were Buddhists and there were all kinds of you know, people, uh, Hindus, and, and oh, they left behind their cultures at, you know, from different times when they were predominant in that, in that valley. And you could dig down, or as Deborah and her husband and many other archaeologists did, and find this treasure trove of archaeological treasures. So that's probably, as near as anybody can tell, 
where Padmasambhava came from. The Swat Valley is also remarkable <coughs> for having a mountain at one end named Nanga Parbat, which has the highest vertical rise of any mountain in the world. It rises 20,000 feet from its base to its top. And there's some terrific books written about the first ascent without oxygen of Nanga Parbat done in the 1930s by a uh, a, an Austrian climber named Hermann Buhl, when I used to be into climbing, I loved that book. It's called Nanga Parbat Pilgrimage. And a great story. <laughs> One of the great pieces of climbing literature. So anyhow, <coughs> Trisong Detson invited Padmasambhava to come to Tibet. And Padmasambhava went by way of <coughs> Nepal. And he went um, with his consort, uh, Yeshe Tsogyo. And she, of course, became a great teacher in her own right. Um, and he, she was his disciple. And they meditated in uh, caves in Nepal um, to subdue the evil forces. And you, if you go to Nepal today, you can go to caves where uh, Padmasambhava and Yeshe Tsogyal practiced. And uh, they're very holy places. They're part of a pilgrimage you can do in and around Kathmandu, outside of Kathmandu as well. And then eventually they got to uh, Lhasa, and sure enough, Padmasambhava subdued all these evil spirits and harnessed them uh, to the Dharma. And then they finished Samye and uh, established Buddhism. And a there were some, he had great disciples, Padmasambhava did, who became famous Buddhists. Some of the greatest ones were people like uh, uh, the great translator uh, Virochana, uh, who's in Tibetan, his name is Bharatsana. And uh, uh, Jnana Garba was another. And a lot of these people, uh, along with Padmasambhava, left what are called terma. This was the beginning of the Nyingma school of Tibetan Buddhism. There are four main sects in Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and the Nyingma is, the o it literally means the old ones, because they're the oldest sect of Tibetan Buddhism. They trace themselves back to Padmasambhava in the 8th century, about 750. And um, Padmasambhava, started a tradition which is known as terma. And this is peculiar to the Tibetans. What terma are, are hidden treasures. That's literally what terma means. And Padmasambhava knew that he had teachings which the people of his time were not yet ready for. And what he did was he hid them, knowing uh, that in the future, they would be discovered by, and by whom? He, he also knew by whom they would be discovered centuries later at a time that was appropriate for them. And there were two kinds of terma. Um, one are called earth terma, and the other are called mind or meditation terma. Uh, earth terma are actually physical objects. And um, Yeshe Tsugyal also left behind lots of terma uh, in her own right. And these physical objects would be hidden in different places. And sometimes they're magically hidden, like inside solid rock. You know? And the teratin comes along. And one of the qualities of a teratin is that he has the ability to actually reach into the rock and pull the, the object out. And the object might be a text. And typically, if it is, in, in a, if it is a text, it's written in Dakini script. Dakinis are these magical uh, female fly, sky flying. Um, energies, you might say, and although there are also human Dakinis around. Um, and it's written in Dakini script, and the Tertan has to be able to read it and commit it to memory in one pass, because as he or she reads it, it disappears. It's gone. And the other kind of terma are called uh, mind terma, and these are received by the teratun, um, kind of like automatic writing. And there are quite a few. Kensei Rinpoche was a teratun up there, the upper left. He discovered ter terma. And uh, Trumpa Rinpoche, man on the shrine, was a terma, both physical and mind terma. Um, both of them received both kinds. And there is a long tradition of these terma among the Nyingmas, um, primarily in Tibet. It's a very important part of the Tibetan canon, in addition to what was transported from India. Yes? Sorry, what is this? 
Rinpoche's Purva? The Terma. Oh, look at that. This is a Terma Purva, right? Here. Pass that around. And these objects contain teachings. Sometimes they might be an image, they could be anything. And many, many, many of the important teachings of Tibetan Buddhism are terma. As an example, um, one of the most famous terma is the misnamed uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead. The real name of that text is um, uh, would be trans. It's the Bardo Todal, which is um, translated as uh, achieving liberation in the Bardo through hearing, hearing the text written. Huh? Okay. <laughs> but there are many other uh, great uh, Therma teachings. And in fact, uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, they speak of the teachings as being divided between Kama and Therma. Kama means word, spoken word. And that refers to everything else but that isn't Therma. Therma, therma of course, is the hidden treasures. So um, a lot of, and, and the terma are always Vajrayana teachings, always tantric teachings. And that's why I'm talking about them here because we're talking about tantra here and how it manifested in Tibet, came from India, and then was developed further by the Tibetans themselves. Uh, Padma Sambhava, Vimala Mitra was another great teacher who went to Tibet in the eighth century and he left behind terma. And there have been others as well. Although the main, um, Tsogya, uh, Yeshe Tsogya left Terma, but the main person was Padmasambhava. He left more Terma than anybody else. So um, these teachings, the tantric teachings, are really, you can see them in a couple of different ways. On the one hand, uh, ordinary people like us can practice Vajrayana teachings. Um, we need to get to them by uh, studying and practicing the Hinayana and the Mahayana first. But we don't, there's sort of, there are two ways to do this. You can, you can as we will, uh, you can practice the teachings before you've realized them. And they are very powerful, these teachings and the practices. In fact, the Vajrayana um, is said to share the same view as the Mahayana. That means it sees the world and us and sanity and enlightenment in the same way as the earlier te lower teachings, the Mahayana. The way it differs is in what's called skillful means. The techniques of the Vajrayana are more powerful and they can move a person faster down the path. Now, that said, I think the view of the, Mahayana, the, ta of the Vajrayana is also a bit different. And also you should know that Vajrayana, Tantrayana, Mantrayana, these things are synonyms. They, they all are talking about the same body of teachings. Vajra means, you know, adamantine. Um, it's, uh, let's see that picture again. Is there a Vajra on the end of that purva? I can't see it from here. Is there a Vajra on the handle? No. Oh, here's a, there's a Vajra. This is a double, do double Vajra. This is a double Dorje. <laughs> You're just looking at it through the camera. Here, you can p pass this around. Um, it's sort of a, a two-dimensional one. Uh, if you had a real one, it would be round, you know, each part of it. And um, it was th the single Vajra. That's a double, double Vajra right there, or Dorje in Tibetan. Was uh, the weapon of the god Indra, the god of war, the Hindu god of war. And uh, it was something he threw. The prongs would open like this. And it was kind of like uh, Thor's thunderbolt. He would throw it and it would destroy whatever it hit. And then it would come back to his hand. You know? And um, it's indestructible, just like lightning. And uh, that's, that's what Vajra means, or Dorje. It means indestructible, diamond-like, adamantine. And... Um, It became uh, one of the main symbols for these tantric teachings. Tantra is a word, it refers again, tantrayana, the tantric vehicle, 
Uh, Tantra literally means continuity. Continuity of what? Continuity of the present moment. Continuity of mind, which suffuses the present moment, primarily. And mantra, of course, we all know what mantra is. Om is a mantra. Om Mani Padme Hum is probably the most famous of the Tibetan mantras. But mantra also literally means mind protection. That when you pr- pronounce a mantra, you're doing mind protection. The ultimate form of mind protection, of course, is meditation. Pure, in it, it, the, the better the meditation, the more it uh, protects mind. But mantra is kind of a magical form of mind protection. So mantrayana, tantrayana, vajrayana, they uh, all mean, refer to the same body of, of teachings. This chapter is on tantra, which is about that. And it's really, <coughs> the tantra teachings are the culmination of these three yanas, these three vehicles, hinayana first, mahayana second, tantrayana, vajrayana third. And the progression goes something like this, that in the, this is the classical formulation, that at the level of the Hinayana teachings, the practitioner realizes the truth of egolessness. This is profound. Um, And what it means is that the practitioner achieves freedom from suffering because suffering inheres in the belief in an I. That's what makes suffering happen. We believe in an I, we want to preserve I, we're unhappy when I is, is diminished, we're happy when I is, um, you know, what's the word, increased. Um, and inevitably, of course, it's diminished because we're going to die. We get sick, we get old, we die. And so belief in an I um, is to involve oneself in suffering. And at the Hinayana level, the practitioner actually discovers uh, the truth that I is a fiction. That's all it is, literally, a fiction. It's, or as Trumpa Rinpoche uh, said to me one time, it's a lie, a lie. You see, the thing is that whenever we come into the present moment, whenever we let go of thought, thought is always about the past and the future, and thought is always about I, I in the past. This happened to me in the past, this is what I got, this is what I suffered. I in the future, this is what I hope for, this is what I fear for in the future. It's all about I, I in the future and in the past. As soon as we come into the present fully, just right here, there is no I, it's just this. And this is what's real. All the rest of it, the thoughts about the past and the future are fictions that we make up just like movie scripts. That's why Trungpa Rinpoche said, I, ego, is a lie. Because it's important to say lie because we believe it and it's not true. I mean, you don't believe the movie script about Mickey Mouse. You know that one's not true. So you don't have to say it's a lie. It's sort of a harmless fiction, right? An entertainment. I mean, the story about Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse and Goofy and all that. But the story about I, that is believed, and that's why it's important to say it's a lie. It's much more serious. And it disappears when we come into the present moment, and this is what the, the accomplishment of the Hinayanist is, that they switch their loyalty from thought to awareness in the present moment. And by loyalty, I mean that, you see, we really believe the stories that we tell ourselves as we walk down the street, as we worry about our future, as we are pissed off and unhappy about our past. We believe these stories. And we tell them to to ourselves all the time, constantly. They just constantly arise and, and inhabit our minds. But they're not true. They're just made up. They're stories that somebody could pen, you know, and give to you. And what's true what is undeniably true is this, what's arising in the present moment. So the Hinayanist has accomplished the switch of loyalty from the stories to the present moment. Now, they are still very, very um, focused 
on the Hinayanist, on the escape from suffering. Because once that switch into the present moment happens, there's a tremendous relief, tremendous sense of, of freedom, freedom from me, you know? and also a sense of certainty of what is actually real. So that's a great, you might say, happiness of sorts for the Hinayanist. But the Hinayanist is very, um, uh, the, the person at that stage of the path is very focused on this discovery because it's salvation and they want to be saved. It's release from suffering and they want release. So they're appreciating it and thinking about it and looking at it. And there's this, who thinks and looks at it and appreciates it? A subtler version of I. It's just that I just gets subtler and subtler. It, it, this is what Trungpa Rinpoche meant by spiritual materialism. It becomes, it, 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 has, it gets so sneaky. It gets thinner and thinner, but it manages to hold on. And when it, the way it does it at that stage of the path, at that sort of the end stage of the Hinayana, is by appreciating egolessness. Ego is appreciating egolessness. Isn't that funny? Rinpoche said, ego wants to be there for its own funeral. <laughs> you know, want to be there and cry tears. Oh, it's so sad. <laughs> goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and so what the Mahayana path is, is the wearing out of that watcher, that one who, that is appreciating that. And as that happens, the practitioner goes deeper and deeper into the present moment, switches allegiance more and more to this present, and begins to discover that not only is I a fiction, but so too is other. Because everything around is just a constant fluxing, a constant presentation that is changing in the present moment. We, th At the lowest level, the, you know, non-Buddhists or beginners on the path think that people and cushions and cameras exist, have true existence in the past and in the future. But that's just that past and future uh, fiction again. In fact, all that we ever experience is there's Phil, there's Carrie, there's the camera, there's the floor. As I turn my head, as our ears pick up different sounds, as our bo we become aware of our bodily sensations or whatever, thoughts arise and pass away. All of this is like a constant fluxing, constant changing in the present moment. And that's what the Mahayana practitioner begins to realize as the person comes more and more into the present. And as they come more into the present, they become much more involved with everything that's going on. Because, you know, the watcher, the eye, is always removed. And that is getting thinner and thinner, so the person is becoming more and more participatory. And this is called the development of two things, compassion, because the person becomes much more interested in the world and much more sensitive to it, and skillful means the person becomes much more uh, able to respond accurately to the environment around him or her because they're not lost in dreams. They're not misapprehending, you know, seeing things through a, a veil of hope and fear. They're seeing things clearly, stripped of the past and those past and future dreams. And that keeps going through the Mahayana as uh, Rinpoche described in the previous chapters in, in uh, Myth of Freedom and elsewhere. I'm going very fast through the path um, to get to Tantra. Because what Tantra, as you see, is what happens at full enlightenment. At the end of the Bodhisattva path, the Bodhisattva really realizes the complete truth of egolessness of I and of non-existence of other. And there is a snap, and they uh, achieve full enlightenment. And that is the entrance into the Vajrayana, full blown. And then the person is seeing what is described in these Vajrayana teachings. Now, for ordinary people like you and me, we can practice these teachings without being fully enlightened, and they will help us along our path. But they are also a description of the world and of the practitioner 
uh, after they have achieved enlightenment. And that's what the Vajrayana teachings are. So they are both. And really that's what Trungpa Rinpoche is talking about here in this chapter. He's describing the world uh, seen through enlightened eyes um, after enlightenment. And, but we can see it too. We just see it through a veil. It's uh, the veil of our self-concern, the veil of our misconceptions. But it's the, the real world is the real world, and it's here for all of us, whether it's veiled you know, and sort of fuzzed out a little bit, or whether it's completely clear to an enlightened person. So he talks about a couple of things, and I'm just going to treat this very quickly. Um, this is a very unusual treatment of it, actually, in this chapter. He doesn't really get into um, the Vajrayana teachings as much, and I think what we might do, I want to talk to Rochelle, is um, go through some chapters of cutting through um, the chapter on Shunyata in particular, which is a terrific uh, chapter on Shunyata, and he didn't present that in this book, and also the chapter on Tantra, uh, which really goes more into the symbolism. But here what he talked about was two things. He talked about aloneness. And the reason is that, you see, ego is constantly looking uh, for reference points. It's looking for things outside itself to prove if that's there, then I'm here. You know? We need company, ego does. And really, what this path is about is giving up that kind of company. When you come completely present, one gives up reference points of all kinds. Um, the idea of accomplishment uh, is given up. The idea that you're going somewhere is given up. The idea um, that you're going to uh, achieve some kind of sukkah is given up because one is completely free-floating in the present moment, which has no ground to it, no ceiling, no walls, um, no dimensions, uh, it's utterly infinite in both time and space. Uh, no reference points at all. And yet, here we are in the middle of all this color. And so, um, really, it's, uh, he talks, how does he talk about it? Let me put on my glasses and look at these notes. He says, you're willing to be a lonely person, a desolate person. You're willing to give up the company of your watcher, your shadow. You know, that's that sense of I it's sitting here on my shoulder and it's saying, how am I doing? And it's generally making me miserable. But it's company. <laughs> it's definitely company. Misery loves company. Company loves misery, too. Yeah, really. Talk about, talk about oh, self-torture. Uh, the watcher. And we have to give up the watcher. That's a, a really amazing idea. That voice that says, oh, this is good, that's bad, now you're doing okay, but you better try harder, or you, you failed here. You know. And generally what the watcher has says is really bad stuff. Don't try that, you'll fail. If you go to that party, they'll never like you. you know? uh, don't go you know, for that girl or that guy, they're going to dump you. You know? um, you're, just a, you're just miserable, you're a rat. You know? And if the watcher had its way, it would kill you commit suicide. That's sort of the ultimate extension of, of that voice, that interior voice that's constantly judging. Because that voice is always saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I've got to make it better. And it's going to be really, really hard to make it better. I don't know if I'll ever be able to make it better. I'm too old. I'm too stupid. I'm too ugly. You know, That's what it's saying. So it's it's very destructive, self-destructive voice. And that's what has to be given up, ironically. And the interesting thing, then he says, the aloneness that's revealed when we come fully present, when we give up that watcher, and we're just here in the present moment without even thinking about being here. It's just like fully here. There's no one saying, now you're here. You don't need to. I mean, who needs to say it? It's utterly redundant, right? It's, it's like, 
It's obvious. Where else am I? And so you give that up. And there's tremendous loneliness in that. And then he says, it reveals the possibility, that aloneness, of cutting through karma. You see, what karma is, is all those stories that the watcher is telling us. The watcher is telling, tell, telling us, well, you know, you, you didn't make enough money in the past, but if you really work hard at this in the future, then you're going to make a lot more money. And you wind up getting enslaved to, in this case, this particular story, the pursuit of money. But it can be anything. The, the watcher is telling us stories, and we get enslaved to living them out, to dreaming them out. To, we become walking dreamers, sleepwalkers, living the dreams. And when you come present, you cut those stories. And that is cutting the karmic chain, the chain of karma. And we become free of it, if only for an instant or for the rest of our lives, if we achieve enlightenment. We become free of these stories, these karmic, because that's where, the, that's where karma really lies. It lies in those stories. They bind us, they entrap us, they snare us because we believe in them. He says that this is the ultimate asceticism. And then he says, when you come fully present like this, searching for nirvana becomes redundant. Who cares? <laughs> there is no nirvana to search for. He says, because we've seen dualistic fixations as games, as entertainments that are childish. This is all his description of ground tantra. Path tantra is that we tread the path. We, and the way we tread the path is that we come fully present again and again. And we identify our thoughts. Kensei Rinpoche had this great quote. Um, uh, he said, uh, it's just like sitting on a train. And you're watching scenery go by the window. And the scenery doesn't have any effect on the train, nor does the train have any effect on the scenery. It's the same thing with watching your thoughts. It's the way you do it. That's the way you watch thoughts. You see them as scenery going past the train window. But usually, uh, especially if we're meditating, we get very involved with them. We either get involved with the story and lose track of where we are, or we attack ourselves for having thoughts. Either way, we're doing it kind of the wrong way. We're getting involved in another self-improvement project. Now, the fruition tantra is uh, the discovery that this world um, in the present moment is very colorful and meaningful. It has a number of characteristics. One is that it's utterly... Um, without beginning, without end, and without substance. It's just, it's like a movie um, that is, you know, passing by us all the time, or we're, we're in it. It's like a 3D movie that we're, we're part of. And the images are just shift, are moving, shifting, changing every instant. You can't grasp it. It's like water going through your fingers to try and grasp it. The second quality is that as it arises and passes away, this present moment, it communicates to us with enormous uh, power. It communicates visually, auditorially, tactilely, olfactorily, if that's a word, uh, gustatorially, that's, you know, your tongue, um, and then mentally, because we, there are six objects of perception, objects of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and mind. And all of these are coming and passing away very, very vividly. That's the second quality of reality, that it's vivid and that it communicates. It communicates the black of this sweater, the red of that hat, you know, the sound of this voice, the taste of chocolate, you know, in your mouth. All of these things communicate themselves very vividly. And the third quality is that we could fall in love with it that we could fall deeply, deeply in love. And this is called, often called um, bliss. The word is sukha uh, in um, Sanskrit, dewa uh, in um, Tibetan. And uh, it's uh, something that's called 
Dewa Chen, great bliss. Uh, and there's uh, our lands, the, the land of Amitabha is called the Sukhavati, the land of, of, of bliss. And that's the third quality. These are the th call, often called the three bodies of the Buddha. The insubstantiality of everything, that nothing has any true existence at all. It's a complete shimmer. It's a, like a mirage that we're in the middle of. That nonetheless, it communicates extraordinarily powerfully and vividly. That's the second quality. That's the second body of the Buddha. And the third body is that there is, it's suffused with love, or if you want, compassion. Huge heat. And that one could really just fall in completely blissfully in love with, with this world. This is the world of Tantra. And um, he says, this is the world of mandala. Uh, that everything is beginning to speak to us, the phenomena that are arising, these six kinds of phenomena, right? Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and mental phenomena, speak to us so powerfully, so powerfully, much more so than for confused people, that they are communicating to us. And so this is... Um, treated in the Vajrayana as symbol. It's not a symbol of anything else. Everything is a symbol for itself. It's as though, uh, as Rinpoche used to say, he says, you pick up a clod of earth in your hand and you're holding the planet. You hold a glass of water in your hand, you've got the ocean. You know, Everything is communicating so vividly and powerfully to you. It's speaking and meaningfully, uh, telling you what it is. All of this is summed up in the idea of mandala. I'm just going to pass this around. This is a very, I just tried on the internet to find a mandala. It didn't do a very good job. I got two, two copies of the same thing. Um, here, you can just take, pass these around and look at them. And the mandala, mandala is the organization of a tantric symbol. Um, the mandala is a circle and it is divided uh, like a compass into north, south, east, and west and center. So there are five loci uh, in a mandala. And each one of them um, is a, 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 a locus for a particular set of qualities. It, so every all of phenomena falls into one or more of these loci, these f five directions, the five, four compass points in the center. Um, and it, so it includes absolutely everything, absolutely everything that you can possibly experience can be classified into uh, the organization of the mandala. Each one of us has our own mandala. Um, we are in the center of a mandala. And when we sit down to practice, we are always facing east, uh, the eastern point of the mandala. That's where the sun rises. And that's because everything is always new. The sun is always rising. You know, and it's setting in the west behind us where we can't even see it because we don't see when things end. <laughs> all we see is the constant new and death. It's, it's happening all the time. And um, also, everything is in a mandala. This little Dharma group is the center of a mandala. The United States is in a mandala. New York City has a ma has its own mandala. Absolutely every every person in here, uh, the city, what are their population of Manhattan is about a million five. Every one of them has a, a mandala um, that they are the center of. They're all all and everybody's facing east in their mandala. So. Um, he doesn't go into the organization of the mandala. I'm just going to mention it briefly here. There are what are called the five Buddha families. And that what that means is the five sort of groupings of qualities. As an example, um, let's take the East. Uh, this is the Vajra family. And there's a, a Buddha 
uh, who is inhabits the east, although he can change the east and the center sometimes flip, but we won't get into that. Um, and the east is usually Vajrasattva. And um, uh, the quality of Vajra is that, um, for instance, in the seasons, uh, Vajra is the winter. Um, in terms of uh, quality of uh, mind, you might say, it's the quality of intellect. It's intellectuals. People who are very Vajra are very, very intellectual. Their minds uh, tend to be very analytical, and they tend to analyze things into their component parts and take them apart and put them back together mentally. They have that capacity. It's a particular intellectual talent. Um, the reason it's the, the, the season is the winter is because in the winter everything is frozen, it's crystalline, sharply revealed. The emotion, the klesha, the defilement that is connected with Vajra is the flip side of intellect. It's anger. Um, it's kind of like uh, the, the, symbol, what is the, symbol, uh, the symbol is the Vajra, uh, the thunderbolt that can destroy uh, things. Um, what else about Vajra? Uh, season, we got... Um, what? Qualities. Huh? Qualities. Qualities or what? Yeah, what would be a Vajra wind or a Vajra sky, do you think? Winter sky. Huh? Winter sky? Yeah, that might be gray and um, threatening. But very crisp. 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 Right. Right, crisp. Okay. That's in the east. Uh, the symbol is the Dorje. Uh, the south is an interesting one. That's Ratna. Ratna literally means jewel, and that's the symbol for it. And uh, it's in the south, the season is autumn. It symbolizes richness, the jewel. Uh, fecundity in the autumn, you know, everything is, it's the harvest time. Uh, everything is rich and about to be harvested. Um, the, uh, let's see, uh, the landscape would be, you know, the harvest. The landscape for um, Vajra is a winter day. Um, Ratna people, oh, the klesha associated with Ratna is um, greed uh, and pride, but especially greed. And um, the virtue associated with Ratna, the wisdom, you might say, is uh, generosity, richness. Ratna is giving. Uh, tremendous giving. If you meet a rotten a person, um, they're very generous, constantly giving uh, out. If they're neurotic, um, they take up all the space, and uh, they, you know they are, and they're greedy. Um, rotten people tend to be uh, overweight um, because they eat a lot if they're neurotic, and um, Vajra people tend to be very sort of severe, you know, sort of, uh, I think of sort of the gunslinger mode, you know, thin, um, sharp, angular. And um, I mean, um, you've met people who when you, they're in, you're in the room with them, they just take up all the oxygen, you know, that's rotten and, and, and it's a bit worse, you know, that's rotten, sort of neurotic rotten. But the uh, wisdom of rotten is beautiful. It has to do with uh, generosity. Each one of these families of the in the four directions, north, south, east, west, has an enlightened action that's associated with it as well. The enlightened, they're called the karmas, the four karmas. They're actions of the Buddha. The way the Buddha pacif uh, enlightens situations. And the uh, karma of um, the Vajra family is pacifying because you pacify through understanding. You know? It's the first thing you do when you want to pacify a situation is you try to understand what's going on. And perhaps by understanding it, you can pacify a, a tumultuous or conflict-ridden situation. So each quality has a color. Has a what? A color. A color. And That's right. Also, the pacifying is that it's water. And then when you think about water, you know, there's a lot of energy in water and how it's 
That's right. I'm forgetting things. The, uh, yeah, the element. Each uh, each one of these families has an element. The element of the Vajra family is water, and the uh, the color is again it flips with the center, but it's usually white. Can be blue. Can be in this model of free here. It's white, the one that I just handed out, um, and that's often associated with Vajrasattva, white. But sometimes it f flips, and Akshobhya is in the east, and then he's always blue. And then the color uh, a that's associated with Ratna is yellow, the time of the harvest, right? Autumn. And the element is earth. It's very, very earthy. None of these are better or worse than any other. You know, so each one of us, we have particular qualities. It's the way we manifest. We have our neurotic side, our ego. But when you, they say, when you become enlightened and you lose that egotism, that being lost in thought, then your Buddha families really start to shine out. You know, and you communicate your own uniqueness. So it's kind of fun. I mean, and if you look at the mandala that's passed around, you'll see that in the east, the color is white. In the south, it's yellow. In the west, it's red. That's Padma. In the north, it's green. That's Karma. And in the center in this mandala, it's blue, which is the Buddha family. The Buddha family is one of my favorites, just because I have a close friend who's very, very Buddha. And it's so counterintuitive to like someone who's Buddha. <laughs> Would you say, Peter? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Buddha family is, uh, Buddha is the element is space. That's the element. Can you imagine? You know, we got earth, for, or we, we have uh, air uh, is, is Vajra, f earth. Fire is Padma. Um, uh, no, no, excuse me. Uh, water is, is Vajra. Um, Ratna is earth. Padma is fire. And Karma is wind. And the center one is space. This is Buddha. And Buddha people, for instance, are very, very spacious. Um, I had a close friend. He was my roommate. And I'm not going to name him. Um, but some people here know him. What? No, I'm not going to. And uh, this person was amazingly Buddha. And um, uh, he used to, uh, his clothes would just pile up in, in his room. He never washed his clothes. Uh, he rarely took a shower, right? Didn't cut his fingernails. This is a Buddha person. They could care less. They just sit. You know, they just they sit. They're perfectly happy to sit and do nothing, right? Um, I, 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 he was my roommate, and I asked him to help wash the dishes. He didn't know how to wash the dishes. I had to teach him how to wash the dishes, <laughs> which he did with some amusement. You know, you sort of thought this was interesting. <laughs> but the vir one of the virtues of Buddha people is that they are enormously spacious. Things that would irritate me, he could be sitting right next to me just pass through him like air, like space, you know? Totally not, it's a kind of generosity, really, to give space to uh, other people's neurotic behavior and not to be reactive. It's really very kind. And he was actually quite a brilliant person. He had a lot of Vajra, too, but he was mostly Buddha. Buddhas are very annoying to Ratnas. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> when the neurotic parts, you know, yeah. the, neur the neurotic parts. I mean, the enlightened parts, you know, it's all fair game, right? So you think Ratna people, Ratna people would be very irritated by Buddha. Oh, enormously. Why, why wouldn't others? I, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, you are. From experience. <laughs> You're very Ratna. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, microphone. Yeah. That's okay. I'll just go. Um, Peter. He, he used to cite Sherb Cohn as the example of Ratna. Oh my gosh, he was. Then, but then I inherited the title, and so he always named me as an example of Ratna. Of Ratna. And um, I couldn't, I, I could not do the Buddha posture uh, in for my tree. For my tree. I, I absolutely could not. It drove me crazy. Trungpa Rinpoche introduced He's us too to... Too spacious. Too spacious. He introduced us to um, a practice which um, we might be able to do sometime uh, together. 
it's um, you ideally you're in a facility. There, there's one in um, at Shambhala Mountain Center in Colorado. Is there one at Carmi Choling? I don't think so. Huh? Might only be at Shambhala Mountain Center in Colorado, where there are actually rooms, and each room has a different shape. Um, it's according to the, which Buddha family it is, as it is as the color of that Buddha family, has a window in it that is the shape is dictated by the Buddha family. And you go into that room <clears throat> and you assume a posture that is appropriate to that Buddha family and you sit, stay there and you see what happens. <laughs> and oftentimes people like Peter, he's very Ratna, the Ratna room and the Ratna posture drive him nuts. <laughs> you, no, I loved it. I loved oh, you loved it. Yeah, I thought you. Oh, so you like the rotten room and, then? Uh, it's the Buddha that I can stand. Huh? And the the Padma, they couldn't get me out of the room. Padma, like, oh really? Yeah, I just love that. Man. Hey, that's interesting. So, it's yeah. So Padma. You know. So you've got a lot of rotten. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and interesting, you know, the it's changes. The enlightened sound is good because it's it's rich and it's well it's welcoming. It's welcoming. Mm. Uh, the activity of rotten. You know, the image images of a rot a rotting log. Uh, I think he speaks of that in cutting through. Yeah. Image of Ratna as a running line that, that is host to all these creatures. Uh, animals. So it's very you know, generous. So there are all these deities that uh, take part in the mandala. And basically it's the idea that the world is arising and communicating its uniqueness to us all the time, very vividly and speaking uh, what it is in the present. Uh, it's only available uh, if you come present and begin to really love this world as it arises in the present moment. And then the world begins to speak and tell us all kinds of interesting things. So um, let me see if what else he had in here. Anything else you wanted to say, Peter? You got the microphone? Um, he says, on the whole, understanding the vividness of the energy of the universe in terms of symbolism, in terms of pattern, colors, and shapes, is not a matter of imagination or hallucination for the real tantric practitioner. It is real. And then this is the meaning of the term Mahamudra, which means great symbol. Uh, he says, the whole world is symbol, not symbol in the sense of a sign representing something other than itself, but symbol in the sense of the highlights of the vivid qualities of things as they are. And this is the world of Tantra. So the basic idea, you see, is that um, once a person gets past enlightenment, then they're not, it's like they, they've gotten past wanting to be free of suffering. That's what brings us to the path. And that desire to be free of suffering inhabits the path for a long time, all the way through the Mahayana. And what frees the person from that kind of subtle egotism of wanting things to be different um, is the full love of this world. And so the tantric practitioner is just constantly dancing with the world, constantly in love with it. In this, as it arises in this present moment, constantly interacting. And that's why they show these uh, practitioners, uh, siddhas, great enlightened people, holding a sun and moon. They're juggling the sun and moon. They're playing with the world. They're in constant da dance. Trungpa Rinpoche said that the virtue is no longer wisdom uh, at the tantric level. It's curiosity, that the practitioner is endlessly curious um, about the world. And as an example of that, um, before he died, he told uh, his students that he didn't want to come back as a teacher in the next life. Rather, now this was during the day when Japan was in its ascendancy, you know, Sony and Matsushita, and all, all they, they just were running the world. They were buying up real estate in, in the States and all that, and they were powerful, and uh, coming up with all these inventions. And he said he wanted to come back as a Japanese scientist. <laughs> We all thought that was funny, but appropriate, given the teachings, you know. 
this idea of exercising your love of the world and your curiosity and your endless desire to explore it. This is Tantra. So really, you see, it's funny. People think that Buddhism is so depressed and negative because it's all about suffering, you know, the truth of suffering and the origin of suffering and the path leading to the cessation of suffering and suffering, suffering, suffering. And it's not, actually. It's extraordinary, extraordinarily life-affirming and celebrating. Vivid. Vivid. Okay, that's enough for me. Tony? <laughs> what about the rest of the suffering? Like in the world, how can you be in love with the world when it's? How do you what? How can you be in love with the world when it's so sad and everyone else is suffering? Well, you or what you want to do is you're endlessly inspired to help people stop suffering, moved by compassion and love for the world. That's what the Buddha. They, they say that Buddhas and Bodhisattvas too travel endlessly through the six realms. These are the the different ways that people suffer, helping people um, you know, move away from suffering, move towards enlightenment. Now, there's certain kinds of suffering that, you know, as long as you're in a body, you're going to grow old and die and, and you know, suffer illness and, you know, lose your hair and <laughs> get wrinkles and, you know, get sick. Um, but those kinds of suffering are trivial compared to the, su the mental suffering that we, we all endure by wanting things to be different than they are, by being so self-attacking, you know, by hating ourselves and wishing that we were different. Those are the real forms of suffering. And that's what the Buddhas um, and the Bodhisattvas help people step out of. But if you want to help people step out of it, then don't you want to change the nature of things? You're still there's still like a a lack of satisfaction with things as they are. No, it's more like dance. And they say in the tantras that all beings, all beings, are moving inexorably towards enlightenment. It's our nature, you know, from the lowest lowest life forms like microbes up to the most evolved, and that um, as they do that, uh, they are uh, interacting, you know, inexorably sort of with the world. It's like a dance. And um, the bodhisattvas and the buddhas are here. They, they say that all beings, like you and me, find uh, teachers, as it were. These are people to help us. Uh, according to our obscurations and, what's the other word? Um, uh, Obscurations and what defilements, the things that that cloud our vision and keep us, um, you know, ha our habits, our bad habits of mind. That these, according to these, these determine the kind of teachers that we're going to find. And when we find somebody um, who can help us, we enter into a, a dialogue, a conversation, and that person responds out of love, out of compassion. Um, out of uh, dance, you might say, making love. That's what Trungpa Rinpoche de described it as. That's what a teacher is constantly doing. It's kind of a constant act of love making that Buddhas are engaged in with the world. Yeah, compassion. Yeah, it's ironic, isn't it? that uh, what they're helping people to do is to change by, stop want, by, by ceasing to wish to change. Um, from, the, uh, from the book, they talk about being <coughs> married to desolation. Our Morapa would live in these mountainsides. What? Uh, yeah, married to desolation. Hold the mic up. Oh, sure. Where he's married to desolation and he's living in these... Um, Milarepa. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
I forget the word they use, but it was like some sort of um, harsh and unnurturing environment. Could you expand on that idea? That was his karma. Um, and it wasn't everybody's karma. Uh, it was Milarepa's karma to pursue his path living in caves uh, as a, a real ascetic. Uh, his teacher, Marpa, it was his karma to be a farmer and a householder and have children and a wife. But that wasn't Milarepa's path, and others of Marpa's students um, each had their own path. It's according to what you need, you know, to stop this uh, self-torturous self-improvement project to wake up into the present moment. And that's what Milarepa needed. And Marpa saw it and sent him uh, to live that way. And he did for the rest of his life. His life, you know, I mean, he studied and used black magic and, you know. And that was in the early part of his life. Yeah, that's what I mean. So it's understandable that uh, his uh, karma would lead him to uh, asceticism, complete asceticism. You know, there are all kinds of stories. I mean, do, were we talking here about Angimula? Uh, is that his name? Angimula was this guy who came, he was a, a disciple of the Buddha. And he was a thief and a murderer. And he killed his, the, his victims and cut off their fingers. One finger for every victim. And he had a mala, I mean, I mean a, a, a necklace that he wore made out of their fingers. And he came to the Buddha and became his student and got enlightened. <laughs> now, if a guy like that... <laughs> can get enlightened. Uh, I think anybody in this room <laughs> has a pretty good shot. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Rochelle wants to say something. Well, I think that the reason that the Buddha could do that with a student like him was because he had a, a certain view. And the view was that um, everyone has the Buddha nature, the gene to attain enlightenment, just like he did. Mm -hmm. But it's just covered up with a neurosis, let's say. And the Buddha had the ability to see a person's intrinsic, intrinsic nature and he treated them that way he didn't treat them as a bad person so when he saw this killer um you know who approached him on the road or in town everyone was terrified but the buddha saw his buddha nature and he just treated him in a very beautiful loving way and that softened him like kempo sultram gamso rimche used to say that he loved to go to 42nd Street because there were so many people there and all he saw was Buddha nature. There was so much Buddha nature that he was made him very happy. <laughs> and that's the key to Tantra mm -hmm. is discovering our Buddha nature. I don't see sentient beings. I see Buddhas. Mm -hmm. One of the Miller songs is I don't see sentient beings. I see Buddhas. Yeah. Well, sentient beings in that, by the way, is a code word, the way that's translated, for confused people. That's what it means again and again in the teachings, sentient beings. So he didn't see confused people, he saw Buddhas. But in the, you know, yeah. Well, perhaps we should end here. Um, Yes, I'm oh, sorry. Phil has a question. Rochelle? Rochelle? Oh, okay. Sorry. Huh? Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering when you were referring to Kleshas. Kleshas. Um, is that the same as the neurotic manifestation, the wisdom in the neurotic manifestation of each Buddha? Yes, I'm sorry. Klesha literally means defilement. And um, every wisdom 
has its corresponding klesha. So the wisdom of um, um, the Vajra family, which is uh, discriminating awareness wisdom, it's called. It's this analytic, you know, ability to see how things are put together. Um, the klesha is anger, and uh, on the Padma family, uh, the wisdom is. Um, uh, What's it called? It's the, the the wisdom that sees the beauty of surfaces of things and appreciates how everything presents in the surface, which is not to say it's superficial at all. It's a particular intelligence. And the um, it, it also uh, has the quality of magnetizing. That's the action that's connected with the Padma family. You know, the the hmm? that's that's the the enlightened action is magnetizing, and the klesha is lust. And then the um, for the karma family, the uh, wisdom is the all accomplishing wisdom. Uh, it's wisdom that gets things done. You know the quality of enlightened mind that brings things to completion. And and the uh, uh, action, the enlightened action that's associated with that, the karma is destruction. And the klesha uh, that's connected with that is jealousy, envy. And then, the, yeah, green. it's green, yes. It's green, green for envy. <laughs> and then the one for the center, um, the wisdom is, um, what's the wisdom of Virochana? It's what? Awareness. What awareness? Discriminating. Discriminating, no, that's that's the East, that's Vajra. I've forgotten, it's, it's, a, it's a wisdom that is very spacious, that allows a room for everything. And the um, uh, klesha, huh? Don't they describe it in Kali Yes. Yeah, and I think we're going to read that at some point. Right. Right. Several. Huh? He gets into it pretty deep in several. Yes, he does. Right. Right. That's right. True perception, too. That's a good place. So let's end. We'll do the dedication of merit. And here, what we're doing is we're really giving up our egos which is a great thing to do, <laughs> you know? Uh, and uh, we're, but we're doing it, we're um, giving away the merit that we, our ego wants to stick on to that we might have gotten from this evening, you know, that, that's gonna benefit me, 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 me. And we're gonna give it away, and by doing that, we diminish our egos. Yay. <laughs> Michelle goes, yay. Okay, so. Here we, may all attain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory.